This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Okay, I can't uh, resist uh, starting this week with uh, uh, some lines from a Leonard Cohen song, which I think uh, captures uh, a lot of what has been going on. It's uh, called Everybody Knows, and the lyrics go like this. Everybody knows that the dice are loaded. Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed. Everybody knows the war is over. Everybody knows the good guys lost. Everybody knows the fight was fixed. The poor stayed poor and the rich get rich. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. So the interesting question for me is, what is it that uh, everybody knows about our current conjuncture? And I want to talk a little bit about the election results that came out on October the 8th in Brazil. Uh, what happened was that uh, a guy called Jair Bolsonaro got 46% of the vote in the first round of the elections. This was 10%, 10 more than the polls were predicting, so he did far better than was expected. And against him was coming number two was the Workers Party candidate who got around 29% of the vote and then a bunch of other candidates. So there had to be a runoff. But it was pretty clear from the fact that Bolsonaro got 46% of the vote that he was very likely would prevail in the second round of the elections. Now, there are a number of things that are interesting about this result because Bolsonaro is a slightly uh, off-color, right-wing, alternative kind of candidate. But uh, interestingly, the results sparked a huge rally on the Brazilian stock exchange. S stocks went up by 6% the next day. The, Brazil the Brazilian real uh, improved by 3% on world markets at a time when emerging markets were generally having a very, very hard time. So the commercial response to Bolsonaro's position was very, very positive. And the big question is why? Because there was nothing in Bolsonaro's record that suggested he was particularly pro-business. Uh, as a congressman, he had been kind of pretty much uh, a person on his own uh, in the far, far right. Uh, he had run in the election on a, really a platform of uh, ending corruption. Now, ending corruption, or as we call it in Washington, draining the swamp, uh, is becoming a bit of a political uh, sort of gambit these days. And there's a big difference between dealing with corruption and using corruption as a means to go after your opponents. And in Brazil, yeah, there seems to be a lot of corruption around, uh, but there's no question that it has been used essentially to emasculate the left uh, rather than to go after the right. Uh, uh, president Dilma was uh, uh, thrown out as president uh, as a result of a corruption scandal where it was simply that she manipulated uh, statistical data. It wasn't personal corruption. The person who uh, went after her ended up in jail for corruption. And the new president who came in was on the record as saying some very, very corrupt uh, things, but nobody went after him. So when Bolsonaro says he's going after corruption, pretty clearly he was going to go after corruption in the Workers' Party and uh, on the left. And this is uh, something which, again, is uh, something that's going on worldwide. The Chinese, for example, have a very big program against corruption now, and it's not clear whether this is against opponents or whether it's really... Uh, dealing with the root causes of the corruption that does certainly exist. Bolsonaro is also on record as actually having great admiration for the military dictatorship, which uh, existed in Brazil in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, and actually raised the question of security, uh, the security of the population, uh, the criminal activity that needed to be dealt with and suggested that he would bring back the military if necessary to deal with it. 
Uh, further, he was uh, expressed admiration for the president of the Philippines, Duterte, who had t- taken extra juridical means uh, to deal with drug gangs and the like. In other words, you come across a drug dealer, you just shoot him dead, and that's it. Uh, so this is the kind of person that uh, uh, Bolsonaro uh, is. And furthermore, he was on record as saying all kinds of misogynistic things, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, negative things of the sort that uh, we've got used to uh, President Trump saying, which earned Bolsonaro the nickname of uh, Trump of the tropics, a tropical Trump, as it were. So Bolsonaro got elected on that kind of platform. So the question is, why would... Uh, all of the financiers and the Brazilian stock market all kind of rally behind him and say, this is great, this is what we want, and this is what we need. Well, it turns out that uh, that Bolsonaro has a financial advisor, and his financial advisor is an economist called Paulo Guesde. And Paulo Guesde is an economist trained in Chicago. Note that well, Chicago. Remember, it was Chicago that provided the Chicago boys to General Pinochet in the wake of the coup of 1973, in which uh, the the socialist uh, president, uh, Salvador Allende, was uh, ousted, and the economy was reimagined in terms of Chicago economic theory. And so the Chicago boys became very, very significant uh, in the first wave of neoliberalization, uh, which was unleashed in Latin America through the Pinochet coup. And here is a Chicago economist who says he is in favor of privatization. He's in favor of fiscal austerity and uh, the budgetary balances and state, if necessary, at the expense Uh, of uh, social programs for the poor, and in particular at the expense of the one big program that the Workers' Party had set up, which was something called the Balsa Familia, which is a subsidy to uh, low-income populations, provided they sent their kids to school and which had actually delivered quite a bit of purchasing power to the the lower classes uh, in Brazil. Uh, Guesde was also in favor of pension reforms. The the Brazilian state pension system was considered uh, far too generous and it needed to be curbed. He was also in favor of privatization, getting rid of all of the state assets. In other words, Guesde is in favor of a classic neoliberal program. And therefore, what the stock market was rallying to was not uh, Bolsonaro, but Guesde's possibility of being finance minister and the financial process that would be implicated. Now, what is disturbing about this is quite simply that uh, there seems to be an alliance emerging between neoliberal economics on the one hand and, if you like, uh, right-wing populism on the other hand. And this idea is something which starts to come out very strongly when you start to look at comparative examples. For example, take the right-wing party that's emerged in Germany since 2013, which is anti-immigrant, xenophobic, uh, nationalist in its uh, things, and rose from almost nothing in 2013 to having some being the third largest party in the Bundestag now. And it had to stand for some sort of economic program. So what was its economic program, they were asked, and they just simply said, it's what the Germans called Ord liberalism, which is uh, a German version of neoliberalism. It's a German version because it's not about free markets and and that, it's about state-guided free markets. And state-guided free markets have been at the center of the European version of neoliberalism and the German version of neoliberalism all along. And essentially the alternative for Deutschland party uh, declared that its economic policy was going to be neoliberal. So here you have two clear examples of far-right populist politics, far-right populist politics which sometimes embraces what might be called fascist, even Nazi uh, propaganda in, in the German case, and starts to look as if there is an alliance emerging then between this one-sided uh, kind of alternative populist right movement and the neoliberal project on the other hand. So I thought that it would be interesting to look and say, well, to what degree do we see this at work in the United States right now? 
and to what degree are we looking at uh, uh, an emergence of that alliance between the sort of politics of Trump, which is kind of uh, far right alternative and embraces, doesn't deny Nazi influences as we've seen in Charlottesville, doesn't deny some of the uh, alternative right uh, politics of the Bannon sort, and at the same time seems to have something to do with the perpetuation of neoliberalism. And I thought the example I would use is here is because it's, it's a, 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 there is a connection, but it's an uneasy connection. And I wanted to concentrate very much on this, the uneasiness of this connection. Consider, for example, uh, the general argument I make, which is to say that neoliberalism has always been a project of uh, the upper classes and the capitalist class. And it's a project to sustain their own wealth and power, and if possible, to augment their own wealth and power. And that the whole history of neoliberalism has been about that, and as I've talked about in previous uh, sessions, uh, that neoliberalism uh, has worked to considerable degree so that the rich have become ineffably richer and the poor have become either stagnant or have lost. So here's then the situation, and the situation which we really need to, 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 to look at. The example I want to use here is this, that it is, of course, hard in these times to give clear definitions of the class structure, particularly when we're looking at the concept of the working class, because we have so much temporary employment, we have so much uh, employment in the, the uh, sort of uh, service sector, the factories are not there in the same kind of way, at least in the United States, they've all gone to China. So there's a problem about that, but there's no problem when it comes, I think, to the capitalist class. And the example of the capitalist class I want to use right now is the example of the Koch brothers. Now, the Koch brothers are uh, inherited, and this is a very private company, but a very large private company, Koch Industries, and they are very, very large. They're one of the biggest corporations in the United States, and they're a chemical corporation, but also a materials corporation. There's almost everything we use these days probably has a piece of Koch brothers product in it. So they are very, very widespread in terms of their uh, industrial interests, but of course they're hugely, hugely profitable. And not only are they hugely profitable, but the Koch brothers themselves are hugely, hugely wealthy. And so what kinds of politics do the Koch brothers follow? Uh, the answer is, well, they are classically neoliberal in many ways. They believe in free markets and free trade. Uh, they are they very they verge upon the libertarian kind of side of things. They want uh, little government intervention. They want fiscal rectitude on the part of the state. They do not want the state intervening. They do not like state regulation and the like. Uh, but they are true to their colours in the sense that they also actually have some somewhat progressive uh, positions. They believe in proper immigration. They believe in, for example, prison reform. And they believe uh, that uh, tariffs are not a good idea. Now, uh, the two first of these, immigration and uh, prison reform, have a lot to do with deregulating and, and, and opening up the labor market, which, of course, is of great interest always to the capitalist class, having free open markets and uh, the fact that uh, a lot of ex-prisoners could not work their way back into the labor force because of the various restrictions they faced meant there was a certain inflexibility in the labor force which uh, they were not going, the Koch brothers didn't, didn't like. So they have some seemingly progressive positions amidst of these other uh, commitments to free markets and uh, free trade and, and, lack, and uh, you know, government intervention and the like. In the early stages, the Koch brothers actually were on record as funding to some degree, uh, even the Tea Party. And they supported uh, the Republican Party very, very strongly and have supported it uh, to their own advantage. In fact, just recently, one of the Koch brothers, and I've forgotten exactly you know, which one, said that the last five years have been the best five years ever for Koch Industries and for their particular interests. Now, it's interesting they said five years because that goes back beyond before uh, Trump uh, election. 
And, of course, it refers to the, the tail end of the Obama presidency when the Republicans controlled all the instruments in Congress and were able to stop almost any kind of uh, regulatory intervention on the, on the part of uh, the, the administration. They were able to stop uh, any kind of expansion of the budget. And so during those years, the kind of the question of the, uh, of the budget was uh, paramount. Uh, the whole kind of question of not extending the debt uh, uh, limit and things of that kind were introduced into the political equation. So there were many things of that kind which actually kept government out of introducing any more levels of regulation. So for the Koch brothers, this was, uh, was absolutely fine. The only thing that Obama could do was to actually legislate by executive order. This was something that was roundly criticized by the Republican Congress, saying he was going beyond uh, the, 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 the authority of the presidency by, for example, uh, banning uh, the mining on federal lands and things of that kind. So Obama issued a whole series of regulatory orders about immigration, about uh, mining, environment, and all that sort of thing. Uh, which uh, were not actually very much to the Koch brothers' liking. But what can be done by executive order can be undone by executive order. So when, Co when, when Trump came in, one of the first things he did was to reverse almost all of the executive orders, which was great for the Koch brothers, so that uh, uh, climate change could no longer be talked about. The Environmental Protection Agency wasn't allowed even to mention the topic. Uh, regulatory uh, controls over mining on federal lands were reduced. Drilling in the uh, Arctic was opened up. Offshore was opened up. Uh, basically, all the regulatory apparatus was uh, of, of the, the finance was gradually chipped away uh, through executive order. And of course, the executive orders on administration uh, uh, on immigration uh, have also come into play. So, in a sense, what we've seen is that, that as far as the Koch brothers is concerned, the, the, the actual uh, sort of politics that's occurred uh, over the last five years has been extremely favorable to their interests, apart from the two issues which they are very much interested in, which are immigration and, of course, uh, not only uh, you know, Im immigration, but but also uh, budget uh, questions and, uh, uh, and, and the like. So the Koch brothers then have done okay out of uh, the cold con Republican control of Congress. And it's hardly surprising to find that actually the Koch brothers have now set up a very large political action committee, and it's actually been active for some time. And it said that they're going to put in something like $100 million uh, into the Republican campaign to maintain control over both houses of Congress. So the Koch brothers then are fiercely, fiercely behind uh, the, 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 in, in, in the elections coming up in the, United, in the United States. But they're actually doing two things which is uh, you know, kind, of, kind of interesting. They are not supporting those rep Republican candidates who are strongly uh, against immigration reform and who are in favor of the tariff wars which, are, which the Trump administration is pushing. Now, clearly, from the standpoint of libertarian politics and from the standpoint of business, Neither the tariff wars nor immigration uh, controls are a good idea. They, both of them are interfering with the flows of goods and services and also in the flows of labor. So from the standpoint of the Koch brothers then, those aspects of the Trump politics which are in favor of putting tariffs on China and putting tariffs on Mexico and putting tariffs elsewhere. So actually, one of the things we've seen, I think, is a, a shrinking back of the Trump push uh, on, on tariffs. Uh, the tariff question has been really resolved now between Mexico and between Canada. There's a lot of sort of noise about how successful this has been from the standpoint of the United States, but actually, it's not that successful and it's not that great. 
There's noise about of agreements. Well, there's a new agree tariff agreement with South Korea. There's a tariff agreement now emerging, I think, gradually with the Europeans, and we'll probably see that accomplished. The one place where there's not going to be a tariff agreement is China, and clearly Trump is going to go after China. And that's probably okay to some level with some levels of business, but a lot of businesses in the United States don't like that uh, either. So the tariff question, it seems to me that the Trump administration is pulling back. But the one area in which the Trump administration has really pushed very hard was, of course, on tax reform. And the tax reform was a huge giveaway to the corporations, a huge giveaway in which Coke Industries benefited immensely. And not only uh, the industries, but also individually, as, as wealthy people, they benefited immensely. So this is, again, one of the areas in which the Trump politics and the interests of the Koch brothers have overlapped very clearly. So look at the picture. The Koch brothers are interested in tax reform and tax benefits. They've got it. They're interested in deregulation of everything. And they've got it from environment to regulation of this. They've, 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 they've pretty much got what they want. And this is exactly the sort of politics which is occurring in Brazil and almost certainly will occur in Brazil. So that what we're seeing then is this far right support of neoliberal projects and the increasing wealth of that, uh, of that class in society. So that the Koch brothers become you know, hugely wealthy. Now, of course, they cut into that wealth by huge philanthropic engagements. And this is the way in which, of course, the rich in the United States in particular justify very much their wealth. So if you go to the Natural History Museum here in New York City, uh, what you'll see in the Hall of the Dinosaurs is that you are in the Koch Brothers' uh, donation uh, hall. Uh, and right throughout, you find that actually every, all, all the kids who go and look at the dinosaurs look around and see that this is all sponsored by the Koch brothers, which is very good you know, PR for the Koch brothers as being good citizens because they're supporting this kind of thing. Go to Lincoln Center and watch the ballet, and you're watching the Lincoln Centers in the, in, in the Koch Auditorium. Again, what we see is this huge kind of uh, philanthropic uh, game which the Koch brothers play in order to cultivate uh, public support and public uh, awareness. So here you have the Koch brothers then, uh, as, as I think emblematic of, of, of what the capitalist class is about. And when people say that it's a hard time to you know, sort of de define classes right now. I don't think it's a hard time at all when it comes to the capitalist class. You look at the Koch brothers and you look at other people. You look at uh, Michael Bloomberg, for example. Now, here is where things get interesting. The capitalist class is not homogeneous. They all have their general kind of support of free markets, free trade, free you know, some, you know, deregulation, privatization, uh, cutting back on uh, you know, fiscal rectitude and, and all the rest of it. So they're all homogeneous about that, but then they have their own uh, particular kinds of concerns. For instance, the Koch brothers hate environmental regulation. They hate all this chatter about climate change. And so that, they correspond very much to what Donald Trump is kind of saying. So they're very happy with what Donald Trump says about that and the fact that Donald Trump puts in charge of the Environmental Protection Agency somebody who's a complete idiot and who hates environmental protection and that therefore is likely to make the render EPA uh, a, a, a dead institution. Michael Bloomberg, on the other hand, takes the climate change question seriously. So Michael Bloomberg is actually putting in, uh, it is said, something like $100 million to the support of Democratic candidates, particularly those who are concerned about environmental regulation and, and, and the like. So, okay, when I talk about neoliberalism and the capitalist class, I'm not talking about homogeneous capitalist class, which actually agrees on everything. They agree on a lot of things, but then there are differences. So that Bloomberg is very much in favor of envi environmental regulation. Uh, he's not in favor of financial regulation, and the Koch brothers are not in favor of financial regulation. He's not in favor of uh, a large uh, segment of the, of the federal government being given over to the support of 
uh, the, the needs of low-income populations, and the Koch brothers are like that too. So when we talk about the capitalist class, of course, there are differences between them. So Michael Bloomberg is different from the Koch brothers, but on the other hand, that's what the capitalist class is about these days. Those are the ones who effectively run uh, American politics. And I sometimes kind of say, look, I think we only have one political party in the United States. Uh, we have two wings of that political party. Let's call it the political party of Wall Street and that the party of Wall Street governs. Now, one half of that uh, party is sort of funded by the Koch brothers, and that's the Republican part. And the other half is funded by Michael Bloomberg, which is the Democratic Party side. Both of them dependent highly upon finance, financing from the capitalist class. Both of them uh, uh, pushing for a politics which is about the support of a, the neoliberal project in general with specific divergences that Michael Bloomberg more interested in, in, uh, in, in climate change and questions of uh, climate management. Koch brothers not interested in that. Both of them interested in the support of education, for example, but a certain kind of education, the neoliberal education, the entrepreneurial education, the, the cultivation of entrepreneurial spirit in school and the li and schools and the like. So both of them support uh, similar kinds of uh, social projects. Both of them, uh, the Koch brothers, being fairly kind of uh, okay about a certain kind of multiculturalism, uh, being okay about certain kinds of, of social uh, concerns about uh, the rights of, uh, of uh, women in a very general kind of way, but, but, not, but, but not too far. So here you have, uh, if you like, this configuration of economic power, which is intervening in politics and intervening in polit political programs, but which finds itself right now uh, actually in a situation where the far right and the far right ethno-nationalist politics and neo-Nazi politics, actually, in the case of Germany, and actually, uh, certainly, neo-military dictatorship politics in the case of Brazil, is going to be supported uh, by the business community. What this suggests then is that the business community in general is actually at this time in, uh, continuing its political support, but it can no longer do so through conventional neo uh, neo neoliberal means as it did in the 1980s and 1990s, and cannot do so by simply authoritarian politics, which it began to sort of embrace in the in, in 2000s and, and so on, and is now actually ready to embrace what might be called far right, far right, even neo-fascist politics. And I've used the word fascism advisedly because neo-fascist politics are, I think, uh, actually what is involved here down the line. And here I would remind you that uh, Franco, Hitler, Mussolini, all had certain relationships with the big corporations and worked very closely with the big corporations over time. Now, I'm not arguing that that is our future, but what I'm arguing is that there are signs that the neoliberal project is in danger and is in difficulty. Uh, those who pursue the neoliberal project among the big business community are looking for mechanisms of support because they are now very few. The last Oxfam report, for example, said that eight individuals now control as much wealth as 50% of the world's population put together. Now, 20 years ago, they would say 340 individuals uh, have that amount of wealth. But now we've just got this increasing wealth, which is, of course, what neoliberalism was about all along. How it is justified these days and how it will be preserved these days is the big question we have to face. And are we going to tolerate, actually, this alliance between neoliberal politics and neo-fascist kinds of uh, political forms which are beginning to emerge around the world in this troubling kind of way? And we look at it and we look at uh, Bolsonaro in, 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 in Brazil, uh, Trump has these tendencies in the United States. We look at Duterte and we look at Erdogan, we look at Modi, we look at all of these people, Orban in Hungary and so on, and we look at all of these people. 
and we begin to see that that is not, it seems to me, the kind of politics that we really want to follow in the future. And this is a dangerous situation and one where it's not going to be solved by going back to sort of Michael Bloomberg's def, you know, Democratic Party. It's going to be absolutely solved by us finding a way out of the dilemmas of what the neoliberal capitalist system has produced and what capitalism in general is now producing. So with that, let me drop the story right here and we'll take up other things later on. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.